We're going to be in the book of James. If you've got your lift notes, you can get those ready to roll. And I want to start with a question. How many of you have ever gone through something hard? All right. Three people are awake. Good. That was the wake-up question. We've all gone through things that are hard. How many of you have wanted to, as, as, as you've gone through something hard, you felt like, man, this has lasted longer than it should? That's the real deal right there, huh? Okay, one more question here. What, what's your, what do you think is your, and maybe you could, you could broaden it out if you want to be too personal. What's the number, what do you think is the number one response when things are hard? Shout it out, let's hear it. What's the number one response you think when people are hard? Or when, <laughs> what's the number one response people have when things are hard? Can't? Panic. Ooh, that's good. Ooh, really. Whining. <laughs> what was that? Whining or waiting? Blaming. Yes. Blaming, whining, panicking. Good. Hiding. It's good. Yes. Those are, those are all real. I like that. Very typical just to kind of want out. This morning we're going to look at a passage here that gives a sobering reality that, in case we didn't know, life's hard at times. And we all know that, obviously, intrinsically. But when it's happening, one of the commonest, most common expressions is what we've talked about right here, whether it's panic, whether it's whining, blaming, hiding, we want out. The phrase that comes to mind to me is we want to hit that eject button, right? Eject, eject. It's panic. It's all of that in a, in a summary, really. If we could, just bam, eject. I want out. And there's some very interesting things happening in our culture that are making this a bigger than normal deal. If I could talk about that for a moment. Emerging in our culture, especially in the generation below me, is that the panic button. I want to be safe. I want to hide. Don't want to go through it. It's just interesting. I love watching society. It's, it's a passion I have to, to read and to watch. And there is definitely an emerging trend. You, you, you heard about helicopter parents for a long time and how that was a trend. And what you see now is these helicopter parents have produced snowflake children. <laughs> overly protective parents lead to overly sensitive kids. It's, it's happening. You, you, you see it. You can't help but see it in our world. Well-meaning even, parents. You know, it's the, the mindset that demands the trophy for eighth place. <laughs> Got to protect my kids from the harsh reality that, yeah, your team stunk. You know, and the, instead of like, you don't have to be rude about it, but instead of the reality of, hey, that, you know, that, that's okay. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes your team just doesn't do well. And what do you do? Oh, you get a trophy for eighth place. No, how about, so you work hard, you come back, and next year, you try to do better. Well, that's too hard on your self-esteem. Got to wait a whole year? Just give them a trophy now. They might not come back. Give everybody a trophy. You know, it, these are the kind of, you know, simple, I mean, in some ways silly examples, but look at the way that right now in our culture, it's so hard to have a conversation, a robust conversation with someone that you don't agree with because it so quickly gets too personal and too hurtful or too offensive. Can't handle the exchange of ideas that might be different than mine. And there's exploded, the whole you know, politically correct culture is exploded. Now, I'm all for speaking respectfully to one another. That's important. There's plenty in the Bible about honoring and respecting others. But it's quickly gone so far that right now, if you know, in our culture, if you disagree with someone and you're willing to, to challenge another person's perspective, you're going to quickly get labeled something nasty. 
me. So robust debate is almost unheard of. Moves quickly to a character assassination. But much of what underlies that is insecurity, not strength. If I'm secure, I can handle hearing that my opinion might not be right. And I might need to consider learning, growing, changing my perspective. But if I'm insecure, and like eject, eject, panic, hide, that's hard. I don't want to hear that I'm not perfect. I want a trophy, even though I stink. So there's, I mean, there's just some real realities of, of and it's in all of us. There's, there's aspects of, of this, we want to be comfortable. We're taught that. Just almost every commercial says, you deserve to just be comfortable. Let me help you have life easier. Just pay me this, you get this easier. So, when culture says, and we imbibe, that comfortable is supposed to be our baseline, comfortable is supposed to be what we deserve, there, there's, there's some insidious things of when it's not, we just want to get out. We want to hit that panic button. Eject, eject, I'm out. So think about that, you fast forward, and then when school's hard, eject. When a job is hard, eject. When parenting is hard, eject. When marriage is hard, eject. And if you actually look at what's happening around our world and in our lives and in society, that's, that eject button gets hit a lot. When a relationship's hard, eject. When, and think about how that might come into church. When God gets hard, eject. So we're going to hit a passage this morning in James that just doesn't leave any room for that. It provides a framework for how to respond in the midst of the reality that we live in a broken and fallen world that is going to be hard. And the solution is not eject, but find the courage to go through it and come out stronger and better. And that's welcome to the book of James. James chapter 1, 2 to 4. And we are going to start a series here and go through the book of James. And it starts like this. Right after he says, hi, I'm James, he goes, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know, you know, that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Also translated endurance, perseverance. And let that steadfastness or perseverance have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing so this is james the brother of jesus in his opening letter to the people of god that he has influence over and just think about this is his opening line after hello good to good to write you life's hard isn't it just the sobriety of God's word is, is just awesome. It's just, he opens up with just a hard truth. Life can be hard sometimes. But he starts right away with a brilliant phrase. Count it. Count it. So he's going to be talking about life is hard. Life has challenges. Life has trials. But his opening line is count it. That word literally means to hold a view, to have an opinion, or to regard something. So this is talking about having a mindset. So when it count it, not literally count one, two, three, four, this is talking about training ourselves to have a mindset. That's one of the things that God's been been showing me over the years of the reality is we all have mindsets and either we're going to take the the posture of I, like a mental ninja i want to grow in training my mind to think biblically to think as god thinks or if i don't i'm going to have all sorts of crazy ideas in here that don't serve me well so what does it look like to train my mind to 
Become a mental ninja. Take every thought captive, as God's word says, and submit it to Christ. The same exact thing right here. Count it in this one little phrase. Count it. His opening line is, what's your mindset when it comes to trials? We all have one. It might just be eject. That's the easy one. That's the predominant one. That's the prevailing one. It's not going to serve us well. So he's wanting to reshape our, our mindsets right here. How do we train our minds to respond well when we're going through a hard time? Do we push the eject button? Do we do everything in our power just to make it stop? He's gonna, what he's going to get at here is what good things in life just come easy? School, high school, that's hard. College is even harder. <laughs> Parenting, very hard. Marriage, even harder. I said that today because my wife's not here. I was going to flip it around, but <laughs> finding, <laughs> finding your identity in Christ, or let's just say finding your identity in general, having, being a person that is secure. All these fights out here in the world that we were talking about earlier, like so much of that happens because it's, there's insecurity, so much insecurity. What does it look like to actually be secure in your identity, which we know ultimately is in Christ? That's hard. Or growing healthy friendships, healthy relationships that know how to work through conflict and forge unity. That's hard. Effectively helping others where you've discovered your own gifts and passions and you've developed them and you now have something to, to offer the world out of the overflow of good fruit in your own life and you help others effectively. That's hard. But what we see James about to say is if we're gonna just hit the eject button on everything, we're gonna find our lives essentially living in a very empty or shallow place. The good stuff is going through what's hard count it what's your mindset when trials come and he goes on to say count it all joy <laughs> that's that's wow right there you can train yourself to have the mindset that god's promise We'll see it here in a moment. God's I'm kind of jumping ahead to see how can he say such a thing like consider it all joy, count it all joy, have the mindset that trials can be taken with joy. Because the promise is that perseverance or endurance, hanging in there and responding well to God, this steadfastness, perseverance is the pathway to perfection. We'll define that a little more in a minute here. But even though we've already read it, perseverance is the pathway to perfection. And so he, he encourages us, James encourages us that our mindset can be that we can face trials with joy. And here's the key though. You can take joy in the promised outcome that perseverance leads to perfection. Perseverance is the pathway to perfection. You can take joy in that promised outcome without taking joy in the trial itself. That's a difference, right? It's not saying, wow, this really hard thing right now. I love this. We're not called to be fakers. That's, that's, that's not how life works. Or it's not how it should work. In the same way where other places in Scripture say, give thanks in all circumstances it doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances like wow this thing is so hard you can be you can find gratitude in it for what god's going to do you don't have to be thankful for it meaning like wow this this a tragedy happened i'm thankful for it i love it i love it no same thing here we don't have to find joy in the painful, broken things of life. Like, I love this horrible situation. But Paul's saying, you can find joy, you can count it a joy when you can fix your eyes on the promise of the outcome when God's involved. 
so you can have a mindset that has a strength that comes into trials and challenges with joy, knowing ahead of time, whatever it is, God's going to get a victory out of this. That's an incredible challenge. That's an upside-down way of looking at life's trials and hardships, is it not? That's a very upside-down way of looking at it. That's a kingdom mindset. It's, look what God can do. I'm going to put my hope in what God can do. Perseverance is the pathway to perfection. I'm going to focus on that in the midst of something very hard. Moving on, the next phrase is, he says, when you meet trials of various kinds. And right there, it's just a healthy sobriety for us, right there in the scripture, just to be able to accept and expect to not have everything in life go perfectly. And that doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It doesn't mean God's punishing you. We live in a broken and fallen world, so things are gonna get messed up. Hard things are gonna come our way. There, there's, again, a healthy sobriety to just owning that. We don't have to say everything's good. Had a, just kind of a fun and, and playful conversation, but it was serious in a sense with someone a, a couple weeks ago when, at church right here talking. They said, you know, it's, a, it's almost a greeting in our culture. Hey, how you doing? Good, good. Everything good? And I said, nope. You know, when's the last time, you know, you say, hey, what's going on? Everything good? No, it's not. It kind of caught him off guard. I didn't know the person well enough, so I'm not, I was playing with him. But, uh, you know, I was like, to answer your question honestly, no, not everything in life is good. There's a challenge here and a trial there and a hardship there. But God is good. God's at work in my life. God's got my back. God's with me. Good things are on the move and happening. And it's, it's subtle, but in some sense, if you take it to a more daily rhythm of life it, it, it keeps us from becoming fakers everything good yep come on <laughs> come on what what world do you live in no everything's not good we live in a broken and fallen world i'm a broken and fallen person it's so i hurt myself others hurt me life gets hard sometimes i cause problems for myself other people cause problems for me not you other people way out there <laughs> I, when i went other people i went those other people. This is, this is the world we live in, and it's okay. To, it, there's something healthy, so we're not fakers. Just own it. We're going to go through trials, and that's okay. doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong necessarily, and it certainly doesn't mean God's punishing you. And the difference is to say you, you have peace when all conflict or storms are eliminated, when everything ceases what we're about, you know, getting into here is the kingdom's offer, offer, the kingdom of God offers peace through and in the midst of the storms, trusting that God's at work to make it worth it. Well, let's move on and see it here. For you know the testing, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or perseverance or endurance, all the same word. But what jumps out to me here is that word testing. It's actually a very cool word. The testing of your faith produces endurance or steadfast perseverance. And that word literally means without alloy. And it's a reference to the refinement of precious metals. Alloy being the cheaper metal that dilutes the purity of the precious metals. So testing is how something becomes more purified. When a metal is quote unquote tested, it's put in a fire where the cheaper metals are, are burned off so that what remains is only the strongest and it therefore becomes a metal of integrity worthy to use to build upon or make into a weapon 
The good thing about hard times is that you, have, well, you and I actually have the opportunity to, to put our beliefs into action to where what we think we believe about God and, and do most certainly on, on, on some level, there's a clear opportunity to, to put it into action in a way where, to put it in a fire in a way where it gets to become more genuine than before, where the impurities will come up and get burnt away so that what occupies that space is something of total purity, total integrity, and now you internally become a person that can handle things being built on. There's a strength, an integrity of the preciousness inside of you that comes out that now has the strength to be built upon or be fashioned into a weapon. That's what trials can do in the hands of the Lord. So put it to the test. I believe that, you know, enter something. I believe that I'm a child of God and my identity is secure in him. And I don't live for the praise of people. All right. Let's go put that to the test. Feels a little bit different than when you're simply singing a song or when you're out there getting criticized for whatever reason, whether it's directly related to being a Christian or not. When you experience criticism, how your brain and heart and mind and spirit process it, you're processing your identity. You're processing, am I living for the praise of people or am I living for the audience of one? Is my source of security, strength, affirmation, acceptance, approval in him? Or is it in others? So you put, it, it gets put to the test. And sometimes what comes up is there's some impurity in that. My belief, my faith in that isn't as pure as I thought it was. Because actually what's coming up in this situation is I care a lot more about what people think than I even realized. So it comes up. But that's good then it can be removed so that next time around there's a greater purity in that faith and now you're stronger in your integrity of character and you can build your life on it and be fashioned into a weapon in the hands of the Lord with it you can go to every single thing you believe I believe God answers prayers in mighty ways it's a great declaration of faith from scripture put it to the test I believe help my unbelief Lord it comes up, what bubbles up in challenging situations is the impurities that are in there. I believe, help my unbelief. What do you, oh, God works with us to strengthen that integrity of character. So now we can build our life on it even more and be used as a weapon in the hand of the Lord. Now you can go to every single thing you believe. God's personal, he's powerful, he's present, he's good, he provides all of that needs to get tested in order to be really real. All of it needs to be tested so that the impurities can rise up and God can remove those in the process so that it's truly pure, more and more pure. There's more and more integrity in what you say and then actually believe and live. One thing to make clear as we're talking about this, the testing of your faith that produces that endurance of the faith. So when we talk about that enduring, as it says, for you know, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or produces perseverance, produces endurance. The kind of endurance that that is biblical is the endurance that has a picture of Roots going down into soil. So when Jesus spoke of the different kinds of, of seeds as, as the word of God is, is, is shared and there's the different kinds of soil and different kinds of seeds and, and he, he paints this picture that in the good soil, the roots are able to, to 
dig down so that what happens? So that that person's faith becomes strong and they can handle all of the heat and all of the wind and all the challenges of life. And so that's, it's a very, very important reality that for us, when we're talking about perseverance and endurance, it's not simply, oh, I, I, just, I just make it through. I just kind of grin and bear it and get through it. Oh, I've endured. I've lasted. Kind of like I'm holding on until it's over. That would miss that what James is talking about, and we'll see here in this next phrase, is that perseverance on our end includes an active learner mindset. It's not just I'm going to get through it. But there's this active learner mindset in which you know that the trials, as they're testing your faith, those are opportunities for what you believe to become more real and more pure. It's not just getting through it until it stops. So there's this active versus passive mindset. Perseverance in the Bible is not a passive, oh, I just kind of lay down and take it till it's over. I get through it. Oh, I persevered. Uh Uh-uh. When you connect it with a testing of your faith, that's where we get involved, where we get to have active participation in this with God. And we know that there's opportunities for us to learn and grow that we are putting into, into the fire, if you will, what we say we believe, and that God's wanting to work with us on those things so it comes out more real than ever through the trial. And so that's very important to know that perseverance is an active engagement on our part. There's a, there's a line that, that just makes me think of this in, in a popular song. What is probably a, more than a song, it's a phrase. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And that's absolutely not true. <laughs> what doesn't kill you might leave you incredibly despairing, damaged, hurt, wounded, and wanting to just give up on life. You might not be dead, but it certainly didn't make you stronger. It's not just persevering, just getting through something doesn't make you victorious. You can get through something and be absolutely crushed by it, where the result on the other side is despair. (laughs) The result on the other side is bitterness. The result on the other side is, I don't believe anymore, or I don't care anymore. It's not inherent that just getting through something makes you stronger. That's what I'm trying to get at. When I say perseverance, it's got to be active. There's an active engagement on our part. That putting our faith into action in perseverance, perseverance is the time to put our faith into action Believing and trusting that God can bring us out on the other end with our faith more real than ever, more pure than ever. That's a big difference. Leads to the last phrase here. And let steadfastness or endurance or perseverance have its full effect that you may be perfect. Perfect. That's not a typo. Turn to your neighbor and say, perfect. It's in the Bible. Let steadfastness or perseverance have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That is very strong language. That going through trials, actively engaging God, putting your faith into action, letting that that hard hard trial of perseverance where you've got to persevere, you've got to stick with it, and you're putting your faith into action, doing that actively and intentionally leads to a full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That is an enormous claim from Scripture. That God's promise, you could say this is a promise, this is a truth, this is God's heart, God's will. That perseverance is the pathway to perfection. As we hang in there when it's hard and allow those situations to test our faith and, 
and bring to surface the impurities and then let God do his work where he gets them out and we actually come through stronger. That process leads to perfection, it says. <laughs> to be perfect and complete. Those are two important words. Let's talk about them for a moment. Perfect or perfection is, comes from a, a, very, a word with a very rich New Testament sense, the telos, where it has to do with, it's, it's, it's perfect, but it has to do with reaching a goal. It has to do with you've, you've achieved the end. You've achieved a purpose. And there's a, throughout the whole thing, it's with a sense of divine destiny. Like God has a telos for the universe. He has a telos, a goal, an end, a divine destiny for all of humanity, for all of creation, for this church, for this city, for your family, for you. There are concentric circles of, of telos, of this end goal purpose that God has for everything that he's ever created strong, rich sense of, of, of divine purpose and destiny, the goal that God has for you. Beautiful. I mean, that should be a beautiful, encouraging picture of this, this, this perfection, this goal, this purpose that God has. And the second piece is complete, which its, its literal sense is having all of the qualities necessary. This would be this, this picture of nobility of character. You, as it says, you lack nothing. You have all of the character qualities and attributes that you need to reign in life. So you put those two things together and the, and the Bible's making an incredible claim that should pull us forward, give us courage to, to go into trials without just eject panic, I want out wait a second, what's the promise at hand? What's the promise that's so good that James, even sa James says, I can even go into this with joy ahead of time knowing what God can and will and wants to do in hard situations, not that he put you there, but what his power wants to do in redeeming things is that through these persevering, through persevering, letting him bring to surface what I believe in the impurities of it and him purifying it, through all of that, I am going to be stepping toward the divine purpose and destiny for my life and becoming complete in my character so that the Bible would say, yes, you're moving towards lacking nothing so that you can reign in this life. That is meant to be good news. So that we're a little bit more cautious on just hitting the eject button. Now, a couple other observations and we'll close. Let me make clear, just to make clear, if something is genuinely evil, God wants to deliver you. God is not a friend of evil. God is not a giver of evil. We're about to see that in the book of James. Like, oh, two sentences later. <laughs> we'll get there, so hold on. Jesus said to pray, Heavenly Father, deliver us from evil. He said there is a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and... I have come to bring abundant life. So by that, he's saying, Satan is not my friend. I don't work with him. I don't say, cool, yeah, that's evil. Let me borrow a little bit of that because they need it in their life. They are not on the same team, <laughs> okay? So if it's evil, it's a different situation here. We're talking, God, deliver us. There is an eject button on evil, okay? Sometimes to, to discern these things is, is, is challenging, though. When's the time where it's like, no, there needs to be a boundary set. I need the eject button. I need God to just get me out of this situation. That's, that, that's, that's a discerning situation. That's not what we've got in the next five minutes here. But just know, 
That is part of God's will for your life. You have the eject button. He wants to deliver you from evil. He does not want you to stay in evil and be abused. That's not his heart anywhere. Another interesting observation is that so far, what we see in this passage is there, there's nothing directly about God. There's nothing directly about God. Now, because it's God's word and there is a promise of an outcome, <laughs> we can know that this is a promise of what God is going to do. But if you read this passage about our mindset and trials, it's not directly about what God wants to do. This is one of those passages about what God wants you to do. This is one of those healthy responsibility passages where what are we supposed to do? What's our part when trials are hard? Now there's plenty in God's word and we're even gonna see a little bit later in James, like in a paragraph, part of what God's going to do. And I've already talked about it by implication. But what's interesting is that God's not directly named because part of the emphasis that we've got, just gotta own sometimes because we have a real relationship with God and God doesn't want us just to be robots in life is that he puts responsibility on us to not only own, be sober about the reality that life can be hard, but then what are you going to do about it? How are you going to train your mind to respond to those situations? And that's where I think this, is, this, this gets very real. I'll, I'll put it in parenting language. One of the most challenging things about being a parent is realizing when your child just needs to go through something hard without you rescuing them so that they can grow in their character into the fullness of the strong person they have the potential to be. That's hard. Our, our, our natural instincts, both you know, maternal and paternal, is, is to just protect, right? I had a situation very recently where one of my three boys came home and they wanted to just hit the eject button on like four different situations. They, they, they came home and they wanted to, it's kind of one of those days, they want to hit the eject button on life. Like, it, not like in like the suicidal way, but in, we all have those days. I'm just done. This went wrong, this went wrong, this went wrong, this went wrong, all very legitimate and just kind of like, I'm done. Like, I, I eject, eject. And so he, he shared with me, and very legit, like four. I was like, wow, that's a bad day. <laughs> like four different, very legitimate situations. Or he's like, talks about, okay, so in this one, this authority figure responded in a way that just, it just was frankly hurtful. And then in this situation, there was a, there was a group of people that responded. It was just, oh, that's, that's tough. That's, that's, that's hard. And then one situation he talks about he, where he, he knows he messed up. And he owned it, but he caused some problems for himself. And another situation was just, man, it's, it's a pressure building up where it's just a hard, it's, it's life. But, you know, it's not something in me is like, oh, I, first of all, I want to protect, you know, I want to fight. Like, I want to like, oh, who, who, who do I need to go? I talk to, you know, who do I need to go and like, you know, not that I've ever done that. I've, but I want to. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there should be something inside of us that wants to like protect our kids. If we don't, that's weird. But it was it was it was legit. But you know, shortly into the conversation, as we're as we're talking, it became so apparent to me. And this is a hard, I mean, this is not a formula here by any means, because as as a parent, this is one of those Holy Spirit help me, God help. <laughs> I need discernment on what are you doing in my child's life. Where are they at right now? What is this situation? Is this, do they need protecting, rescuing? Because sometimes that's what they need. This wasn't that. This became clear of, whew, this is hard, but if I had pushed the eject button for him, it would have cut short his opportunity to grow into a man of character. It was very clear to me, to the best that I could listen and discern. So as much as my instincts wanted to help him protect, push the eject, not the right move. Now, 
I was there for him. Thankfully, he wanted to talk about it. So we talked, and he needed lots of reassurance. He needed that affirmation of this is who you are. This is who you are in your parents' eyes. This is who you are in God's eyes. You are strong. You are awesome, etc. He needed to vent. He needed to just blah. Yeah, that's, yeah, I get that, man. That, guy, that guy's an idiot. Yeah. No, not being rude, but you know, he, he needed that affirmation, all of those things. Just needed a listening ear. Needed to just let it all out. And by the end of it, he was ready to, to talk about you know, what, what, what can I do in my response to make it better? How can I learn from it? He, that wasn't his language. That's mine, looking back. So he went to the school the next day and, and uh, had a much better day. Debriefed, how'd it go? I, I was praying for you. Gave a little debrief. Yeah, yeah, today was a much better day. Kind of boom, 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 just went through it. And it was just one of those situations where it reminded me, this, is, this has got to be how our perfect Heavenly Father sees us a lot. When we're going through the normal challenges of life, He is on our side to rescue from evil, deliver us from evil. But if it's part of the normal and healthy growth process that He wants us to, in which he wants us to learn how do we respond well? That if he just hits the eject button, then we're gonna miss out on incredible gifts of learning how to respond to God well in, search, in certain situations. Like for example, what does it look like to actually learn how to humble yourself and go to God in prayer where you rely on him for strength? where you rely on him for peace, where you're able to do what the word talks about doing of, of, of having, fixing your heart on promises, where you're able to worship him for what he's going to do before he's done it. And there's a, a satisfying of the soul. There's a freedom of the soul that happens when you're able to lift up above the circumstances in worship. Or if it's in a relationship challenge and you just get ejected, what if that takes you away from the all-important opportunity to learn how to work through conflict or forgive or own that you messed up, say you're sorry, or when things are, are, are just hard, disappointing, if he ejected you, what did it, what, how, how, how would you ever learn? How would we ever learn what it looks like to have our hope in him? Or when things are just feeling empty and he just, boom, rescues with ease, how would we ever learn that he's what satisfies our soul? If God rescues us out, out of every situation, the moment it becomes uncomfortable, we will never grow into Christ-like character like any good parent he wants the best for us so he gives us the opportunity to persevere and thus step toward our telos our destiny where we become a person of noble character lacking nothing that's what the bible would call christ like and if we look back on, on any person that we respect, whether you could go in the Bible, you could go outside the Bible, if you look at any heroic figure in your life, just test out that incredible reality that deep character doesn't grow in the absence of challenge. It grows in the middle of opposition. Deep character doesn't grow in the, in the safety of the shire. It grows out on the, the battlefield of Mordor. Seriously, think about our life though. We, we're told, oh, just stay in the Shire, stay comfortable. No, in the Shire, you get fat, you get lazy, you eat too much, you drink too much, you smoke too much, and you start looking like a hobbit. You know, we got to get out into the battlefield so the true strength that's in here can emerge in the midst of challenge. That's every heroic story. 
You don't unleash the heroic in a safe place. That happens on the battlefield. Now, God's word is full of places where it says he wants to be our refuge. He wants to make us lie down in green pastures. So there is a healthy rhythm of learning how to retreat well, abide, get refreshed with the assumption that you're going back out into the battle. Can we approach, approach life's challenges with, the, with this mindset? Rather than hitting the eject button, we're going to train our minds to say, perseverance is the pathway to perfection. Perseverance is the pathway to perfection. Let's take a minute and pray. I want to just give us a moment just to ponder on in what way in our life can we live into this biblical mindset in a greater way? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask right now that just in a, in a, in a brief and quiet moment that you'd help us to reflect on what truth from your word do you want to seal on our hearts today? Is there a specific situation that you want us to bring to mind to encourage us? Is there the mindset in general where you want to retrain us to help us ahead of time say, I'm going to have the courage to go through hard things with the mindset that I get to live out my faith and I get to have God bring to surface what's real, what's not real, get rid of the impurities and come through stronger so that I'm moving towards my God-given divine destiny, a person of Christ-like character. We pray your Holy Spirit would help us hear you right now. Sing a new song.